Welcome to Mid-Century Living, your weekly podcast about everything mid-century and how to bring the best of the mid-century to your everyday lives. Welcome to Mid-Century Living, the show where we talk all about the mid-20th century then and now. We're your hosts, Jackie. And Gonzalo, thanks for joining us today. Before we get to today's topic, if you're enjoying learning about the mid-century, please subscribe, drop us a like, and leave us a review in whichever platform you're listening to us on. It really helps us get on listener lists and keeps our podcast alive. Uh, So, Gonzalo, how was your Halloween? So, my Halloween was fun because it was just a Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) I am like Scrooge, but for Halloween, what would that be? Yeah, we don't have a good one for Halloween. Oh, so I turned my lights off in the front porch and i played call of duty and that's what i did because candy's expensive candy is expensive but it's only one day a year <laughs> the bags at heb were 26 bucks a piece and i'm not buying just one bag i'm buying multiple bags because i would eat the candy how many pieces were in those 26 dollar bags uh anywhere from 50 to 120. that is bananas yeah i bought two no it's candy <laughs> <laughs> um, I bought one 54 piece bag of candy thinking that that would be fine. And it went fast. Like, so I actually sent boyfriend to the store to buy another bag of reinforcement candy because we were like running through our candy so quick with the trick or treaters. And then as soon as he came back with that second bag of candy, everyone stopped trick or treating. Like we had the most kids before the sun even really set. And then they were done by seven. So now I have a ton of leftover candy. Now, here's the real question, though. Following our Halloween special, did you make them perform a little dance? I did not, though I did insist that they said trick or treat because some of them just like you open the door and they just like hold out their buckets like like you know what to do. I was like, no, no, (laughs) you have to say it or I'm not going to eat candy. (laughs) So um, (laughs) that helped. But there were a couple kids who were just too young to talk, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and their mom had to say trick or treat for them. Like, they just like, look at the kid and look at you and say trick or treat, and look at the kid. And then like, you, I let the kid have the candy and then the, the mom say thank you. Like the kids don't talk at all. They're just like standing there in their little outfits. It was precious. Those were my favorite ones. Like the kids who were just like too shy, but they were still dressed like Ariel, like whatever. Um, mm-hmm. they were pretty cute. And then, um, we watched Poltergeist which was cheesier than I remember. It was wild. Have you watched that recently? Um, I watched it last year. Oh, I hadn't seen it since I saw it at like a sleepover when I was 13. And it Mm -hmm. was terrifying then. And it's just a wild ride now. Like it's not, it wasn't scary. It was just crazy, (laughs) but it was really entertaining. It was a fun time. I did have one more Halloween-y thing. Uh, yeah. because I went to the store Monday before Halloween and I bought a pumpkin because I wanted to make pumpkin soup. Um, and I was like, oh, I should probably get another pumpkin so that I can make pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. And I said, like, I'll just stop by next weekend when I do my grocery. And my local grocery store is already not selling pumpkins. And I was very disappointed That's to the crazy. point that I almost, I was like, walking down the aisles towards the front and at H-E-B, they usually have the managers there and they always are like, hey, we go to this line and how was your shopping experience today? And I was like, please ask me, please ask me because I want to tell someone that they need to sell pumpkins more often. So what are you going to do for Thanksgiving? Skipping pumpkin pie again? I mean, no one in my family likes pumpkin pie Aww. other than me. So it kind of saved me from eating an entire pie by myself. So... That was my week. Anything else with yours? I know we kind of went back and forth. But... Oh, I did make popcorn balls. Like I said that I might. And those turned out okay. Uh, basically, like my Halloween baking and treat making this year was inspired by finishing off the candy corn. So I made brownies and put candy corn in it. And I put candy corn in the popcorn balls. And then I made pumpkin cookies and stuck the little pumpkin candy corns in the top of them. Like the little peanut butter ones with the Hershey's Kiss. But it was pumpkin cookies with the pumpkin in it. Nice. Does the candy corn pumpkin not go into the oven during baking? No, you do not. Listeners, you should have seen Jackie's face 
when when I suggested that atrocity. <laughs> well, then it would be melty sad pumpkins, and I wanted them to be pretty. So <laughs> I you just I just made the cookie scoop, and then didn't do anything. I just left them as balls and baked them, and then as soon as they came out, it was like two hands like pumpkins at like it was as fast as you can squish a pumpkin into the top of each cookie before the cookies cool off at all and they actually adhered pretty well like you could turn it upside down and they stayed in there and they looked really cute so i ate an entire bag of candy corn by myself <laughs> <laughs> i um almost did but instead i decided to put it into baked goods to try to feed it to other people and that worked pretty well actually so Oh no, I bought the candy and then on Halloween while I was being Scrooge and playing Call of Duty, I was eating candy corn. <laughs> we had trick-or-treating in our school and we had to go, like the teachers had a little bag that said trick-or-treat and we could go to like the different principal's offices and all like the staff offices. And the shout out to the 11th grade uh, assistant principal because they had gone above and beyond. They had their conference room, the lights were off and it was like super decorated and like purple and orange light, like Christmas lights and stuff. And like they had different bowls and they had like good, good candies, but also like those packages of the, the peanut butter crackers and bags of chips. And wow. they did, we do, they won Halloween. Yeah, that sounds great. So anyway, Jackie, what are we talking about today? So today we are talking about mid-century modern, the design concept. Since it covers a couple different areas of design, we're just going to do an overview of just mid-century modern, and then we can maybe get more niche later and do deep dives onto the specific sections um, in future episodes. If you guys are into that, please send us a DM on Instagram or send us an email if you there's any one you want to hear sooner than any of the others but today we're just going to do an overview of the whole design concept so what is mid-century modern is the question right i sound like a teacher <laughs> i am a teacher you are a teacher uh, <laughs> the definition the term mid-century modern was used as early as the 1950s but became popular after being defined as a design movement in the book mid-century modern furniture of the 1950s by Kara greberg and it is a design movement for architecture, furniture, and graphic design from about 1933 to 1965. So that's what most people define it as, those year brackets. But the purists will say that it only lasted for the 10-year period from post-World War II, 1947 through 1957. And you've heard me mention them before, but the MCM purists are super fun people who would probably be great at parties who sit around on Facebook <laughs> and I are the first to tell you that something that you are taking a picture of or sharing with the group is not MCM. And while being especially persnickety, they're not technically wrong. There is a difference. And that's really why we're talking about this today between mid-century modern and just mid-century. Mm -hmm. So everything that's mid-century modern is also from the mid-century, but not everything from the mid-century is mid-century modern. It is a very specific design type. Mid-century modern, often in the U.S., uh, was used as a way to bring modernism into the uh, post-war suburbs of America. And it follows the modern movement, which started in the late 1890s and ended up uh, going through both World War I and World War II. And that is what morphed into mid-century modern. The signs of the mid-century era are wide-ranging in style, um, and they often shared specific characteristics like clean lines, organic shapes, and a focus on functionality. Yes, this influenced interior product and graphic design, and also architecture and urban development. Um, basically, anything can get the mid-century modern treatment because the designs themselves are so efficient, minimal, and angular. And you can apply it to like beds, dressers, consoles, desks, lots of stuff that we'll get into later. Yep, yep. So how do we get to MCM? Yes, modernist movement, but also um, we have a lot of influence by the Bauhaus School of Design. So the Bauhaus was a design and architecture school in Germany in the early 20th, uh, and it focused on an emphasis on clean lines, functionality, and futuristic look. So if that sounds familiar, that is basically mid-century modern as we just described it. 
And these German architects and designers emigrated to the USA following World War II and bring those design ideas with them to the USA. So the influence of the Bauhaus coupled with that mass production mentality that emerged thanks to the war effort during World War II in the USA is really what fueled the NCM movement. Cool. So what about graphic design? How do, what do we know about that? So the main qualities of MCM graphic design are using flat graphics and minimal color. Usually it's a small range of colors um, and they really only try to demonstrate the critical variation in shadow and changes in materials. So instead of it just being like a totally shaded illustration, it's only absolutely necessary shadows. And the shapes themselves were simplified or abstracted from what they were trying to represent. And um, another really common trait is clear and prominent typography. So some designers were influenced by something called the Swiss International Typographic Style, which was mainly sans serif text neatly organized, like ABC's logo is a good example of one that's still around today. It's just nice. ABC in lowercase sans serif font in a black circle. So the uh, designers that were influenced more by Bauhaus tend to have more unique typefaces that actually played with shapes themselves. So the text could even take on some of the characteristics of what they were describing and be shaped like little pictures. And the they would make art with the words in this case more often than not. So some iconic examples of MCM graphic design are um, Paul Rand's logo designs. I already mentioned ABC. But he was a pioneer of mid-century modern graphic design and did a lot of logos that are famous. IBM, UPS, and ABC are three famous ones. Really? Yes. <laughs> and they're very simple, clean, just the letters and no frill. Another famous example of MCN design is Lucien Day's pattern work. She was a British textile designer um, in the 50s and 60s. And she did basically developed a new style of abstract pattern making that started with British textiles and moved on to wallpaper, ceramics, and carpets. Um, probably do maybe some kind of companion Instagram post so I can post some pictures of these examples so that you guys can follow along. Another iconic graphic design that you would recognize if you saw would be uh, the book covers by Rudolf de Harak. He did book cover designs for a lot of paperbacks that are simple graphic overlapping shapes, which is a characteristically mid-century modern technique. Um, he also combined very distinctive color palettes and geometric shapes, which was also in the pattern work from this era and is a very, very mid-century modern technique to use. Yeah, that's all I've got for graphic design. Cool. We're going to go in order of enthusiasm, actually. So next is <laughs> MCM furniture. Um, another favorite thing, and usually where the MCM purists come out of the woodwork on Facebook, because usually it's someone, some well-meaning person at a thrift shop will post a picture to the group and say, is this MCM? And it's like a colonial rocker. Like, definitely 60s, but not MCM at all. And then the first 45 comments are just, like, dudes saying, no, this is an MCM. Nim, 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 nim. Uh, but anyway, when you get actual MCM furniture, you can see why people are so enthusiastic about it. Because um, it's beautiful. So uh, the qualities of MCM furniture are lack of ornamentation and minimal pieces. Um, basically, they lack unnecessary decoration in general. So if you find something from the mid-century and it is ornate in any way, it's not MCM. Furniture designers at this time tried to focus on pure or honest materials. So it was fiberglass, plywood, aluminum, steel, foam, and plastic, and pretty much it. They tried to do one or two materials tops per piece. Um, they usually have or always have a bold form or a unique shape. Um, basically, they tried to rethink each piece of furniture, furniture and uh, redefine the necessary pieces that make up that piece of furniture. So what makes a chair? That's the kind of question they're trying to answer. So it usually resulted in a shape that doesn't look like a normal quotes 
chair or table. Um, and we'll get to some examples later. But they also, it's very important that it focused on function. So they sometimes fit into each other or folded for easy storage or stacked on top of each other. Um, like we're designed to be stackable. They had the popular design adage, form follows function. So it was always really, really functional and really, really simple, but really, really pretty. Now that we're getting to some iconic examples, uh, the bold form or shapes Probably the best example I can think of is the egg chair, which was designed in 1958 for the Radisson Hotel in Copenhagen. And if you Google it, you will re recognize it. It is basically, so a normal chair, quote normal, has a back piece and a seat piece. And the egg chair is one round shape that kind of looks like if you got an egg and stood it upright and then sliced it diagonally from the top corner to the bottom corner and you just sit in that, that's what the egg chair looks like. So it um, is basically just like one big shape that you sit into and then like a metal stand at the bottom. And it's very, very cool. Totally redefined what a chair can be shaped like. Um, another really cool example of bold forms and shapes um, are the tulip dining table and chair. Um, the chairs, the tulip dining table everyone's seen, I think they're still making them at Ikea, actually. Um, it's just the big white disc and the, it's got like a stand in the middle that just mm -hmm. goes straight down and opens to another circle and it's like white plastic. Smooth we had a bunch of these yeah. in, our, in our break room when I worked in an architecture firm. Yep. It's a very iconic design. And then the chairs are way cooler that he designed to go with them. So this was, he was in architecture. So maybe you know how to pronounce his name. Can you read that? Uh, what, Erosarinen? Yeah, thank you. Um, he was a talented industrial designer and designed these, ch these um, tulip chairs in 1955 to complete the tulip dining table. Um, it has a very space age vibe. I actually refer to these whenever I see them at antique malls or furniture stores as Star Trek chairs. Um, <laughs> they are the kind of like the egg chair in the sense that it's just like one big piece, um, but it's like white on the back and then the seat cushion is a different color and it matches the table and is very cool. And then the last and probably most iconic example is the Eames chairs. The lounge chair in Ottoman specifically was designed for Herman Miller in 1956, um, which have curved outer shells in molded plywood and soft leather cushions. And this chair is incredible and I want one so bad. And you can actually still buy them today from Herman Miller and they are for the low, low price of $6,800. Low, low price. <laughs> That's why I don't have one. <laughs> I would love to have an Eames lounge chair. I mean, I don't have a nice enough house. I would have to like buy a new house to showcase <laughs> this chair. Yeah. But yes. But, but speaking of Charles and Ray Eames, so the Eames were pioneers in the use of molding plywood. Uh, in their designs and one of the things that they're credited with is a little bit before borderline before when we discussed mid-century because they used it in the early 1940s for the war uh, war effort but the Eameses what they did was they tried to solve the problem that the medical corps had with uh, leg braces because whenever they used metal leg braces for injuries on the field, those metal leg braces tended to cause further injuries to the legs of the soldiers because of vibrations in the metal during transport. So what they did was they created a molded plywood uh, leg brace with, you know, has all the holes for you so you could tie the leg to it. Um, and they, they're stackable, they're, so they're easy to transport, they're lightweight, so they're easy to move. And they solved the problem of the metal sprint, sprints. And you can find them still. The Eames office sells them. And then you can find them on eBay and stuff like that. And they are also a low, low price 
starting in the mid thousands and by that i mean like 1500 but they're really cool looking i mean i don't know i don't think anybody buys them to use as leg sprint as splints they use them as you know this is a piece of mcm iconography very cool so next we'll get to mcm architecture and i'll let you take this one awesome okay so uh mid-century modern architecture uh its biggest characteristic is the design based on function over form. So everything is simple. Style is all about functionality, meaning there's no piece that is without purpose. And this also kind of helps us connect to today's world because pieces from this period are meant to last. And oftentimes they are still around with us today. Also minimal ornamentation, uh, simplicity, meaning style without clutter or without super superfluous ornamentation, meaning no frills, no lacy things like in Victorian architecture. If you think Victorian or you think craftsman architecture, a lot of it is like a lot of little curly cues and additive things that none of that exists in MCM. And it extends to the creation of furniture that goes with the space. World War II or post-World War II, I guess, man-made materials also help characterize MCM architecture because we start seeing these new man-made materials like vinyl, plastic, fiberglass, and nylon mixed in with natural materials like wood and glass and metal in architecture. And with colors, we start seeing natural hues brought into the project. Bright accent colors against primary neutral tones. Fusion of indoor and outdoor, which leads to uh, MCM color palettes rooted in nature, so earthy greens, Fall oranges and yellows, muddy browns. That's a type of more muted color palette. And just like with furniture, we have some clean lines. A lot of the furniture is built in, so it's specific to the building project. And because a big thing is this communication between indoor and outdoor, we still start seeing a lot of floor to ceiling windows, a lot of openings. So a lot of these windows are actually sliding doors that open into an outdoor space to create kind of like an indoor outdoor space. And some of the iconic examples are things like the Elrod House by John Lautner, which is in Palm Springs, California, which also was made famous by the 1971 James Bond movie Diamonds Are Forever. And its big thing is a series of well-placed skylights, which kind of make this cave-like building look light and airy. I like the phrase well-placed because it's like someone's complimenting him. Like, ah, yes, these are well-placed skylights. <laughs> um, another big one that a lot of people probably have recognized, maybe a lot of our listeners have been to it, is the Transworld Air Flight Center or the TWA Terminal. Uh, and this one is by Aero Sarinen and it's in Queens, New York. And it was built around 1962. And it's... A flowy structure is very organic and it looks like a bird in flight. It's kind of the starts low and kind of gets big as it goes to the to the sides. And it really looks kind of like a bird opening its wings, uh, which Sarinen has said was purely coincidental. So I'm not sure, but that's what he said. And my last example today uh, is the Eames House by Charles and Ray Eames. And this is in Pacific Palisades, California. And it's the same Eames that did the Eames Lounge chip. <laughs> and this is a, an interesting house. It's two raised steel and glass structures with flat roofs, a uh, lot of bright color blocks, an intentional connection with its natural surroundings. And at risk of being ridiculed by my architect friends and my past life as an architect, I've never liked this house. Why? I don't know. It's as a hundred percent my opinion. Okay, in 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 this situation, my opinion differs from the MCL podcast. Um, <laughs> so, but it, it's speaking of of what I think as my personal opinion today. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about its impact on the present day? Yes, let's do that. So, one quick transition is that the TWA terminal that we mentioned as an iconic example is still there and largely unchanged um it was actually um if any listeners watch the marvelous mrs Maisel, there was an episode that about half of it took place in this terminal and you plop a bunch of people in 1960s clothes in there and they it 
is basically a time capsule. It's fantastic. So mm-hmm. um, that you could still go to. Yeah. So what's really cool also about the TWA um, terminal is that it's a hotel. So you can actually go and stay in there. And one of the iconic parts of the terminal was this sign at information that told you the departures and arrivals, uh, you know, the, the stereotypical signs at an airport. But the terminal used a Solari split flap sign, which is the ones where like, they're not digital. They have a bunch of like ticking letters. Oh, so where they like letters flip? In each... Yes. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, well, this one's really cool because it's sh- it, it, the outside is shaped like very futuristic, very TWA terminal, very organic. And the inside has the sign. And when they redid the building, because the building sat kind of empty and neglected for many a year. So when it was redone into the hotel, they actually contacted the original sign maker and the original sign maker made a replica of it based on the original design. So it actually is the one that's there now. It's not the original one, but it might as well be the original one because it's done exactly like the original one was created. Cool. Anyway, sorry, let me nerd out for a second. <laughs> so um, the original MCM houses and buildings are loved and highly valued today for what they are, which is historic it is actually pretty easy to replicate the MCM characteristics these days because of how simple and organic that they are. Um, it's easy to blend MCM with contemporary architecture because it pairs so well with new styles and the pieces are so timeless that they don't look out of place in any modern design. You could even use a single piece as a focal point, like if you buy an Eames lounge and it's now the highlight of your whole home and living room. <laughs> I would have to uh, live inside of that Eames chair in, in order to afford it. <laughs> yeah, I'm still hoping one day I'll just find one at an estate sale, but I don't know if that's going to happen because everybody everybody loves that chair. But if you're looking to furnish your home in MCM, um, estate sales is a great way to start. You can sometimes get lucky at a Salvation Army or on Facebook Marketplace. Um, if you want to buy mid-century modern style New furniture, a lot of stores actually, um, this basically, this design style never went out of style. And a lot of brands are making new furniture with these design principles. So you can go to Article, Room and Board, EQ3, Crate and Barrel, Joybird, Inside Weather, and West Elm. Though I have heard that West Elm couches are not very good. The rest of their stuff, like their um, bookcases and coat racks and or coat hooks, I should say. They have really cool, like, stuff you build into your walls as MCM-style organizational things. They all make really cool MCM-style furniture. If you're on a budget, Wayfair even lets you sort your search by MCM. I have a pretty authentic-looking MCM-style couch. It's green velvet with wooden legs. And I got that from Wayfair, and it was the best $300 I ever spent. So it's actually like $600 on there now because the prices are going up on everything. But um, definitely got my $300 worth. Yeah. Do you recommend? I have a mid-century inspired couch in on chair in my <laughs> living room. Um, but they were from at home. Nice. Um, if you are renovating or remodeling and you'd like to incorporate some MCM, some good resources for that are Retro Renovation, which is a blog, which is unfortunately now archived. They haven't been adding new articles to it since 2021, but they're leaving the articles up. So uh, it's a really good resource if you're looking for light fixtures or anything like that. They um, make sure that everything they recommend in there is authentic. It's a lot of, they also feature a lot of um, small makers and Etsy shops and craftsmen who are still doing home furnishings and things in MCM style. Also, Make It Mid-Century is a another great resource. They are currently making um, sparkle laminate and garage door kits, and they are authentic mid-century style building materials that they're very, very cool. And they make they started making like picture frames and um, 
all this really cool MCM house stuff that you should definitely check out if you're looking to turn your house into an MCM paradise. Awesome. So since we are getting close to landing the plane, we can maybe say we are in our final descent. Uh, it sounds like it's about time for our weekly etiquette segment. So uh, Jackie, do you have one for us today? So, according to Emily Post, did you know that your right hand was considered your social hand and your left hand was considered your personal hand? Interesting. What do they mean by personal hand? So, uh, basically, it's considered rude and impolite to hold your drink or handbag with your right hand because you're supposed to leave your right hand for shaking hands with people. And that's what it means by your social hand. Whereas if you need to do anything with personal items, you do that with your left hand so that your right hand is always clean and ready to go. For handshaking so um, if you're at a party you have to hold everything on your left hand so that your right hand is free and also if you need to cough or sneeze you have to do that into your left hand so that you never absentmindedly shake hands with the hand you just sneezed into interesting i like that and i didn't realize that i subconsciously do that because if i sneeze or i cough i go into my left elbow because it's i don't know more comfortable i've never thought about it put in these terms but this well, I guess mostly etiquette is also just like a good habit to get into. Yes. Because I like the idea of, yeah, just making sure you hold everything at a party in your left hand so that your right hand's always available for all of the people you're going to meet. So, and the sneezing mm-hmm. is just good. That's just a good habit anyway. So I like this one. What do you think? I, I'm 100% behind it. I didn't realize I was already following this etiquette rule. But um, no, I, I I like it. It keeps your right hand, especially in this post-pandemic era we live in. I think it's very important to keep your right hand good to go. <laughs> I agree. So I say we give this one the mid-century living stamp of approval. I concur. So with that, listeners, it looks like we have actually landed the plane. Uh, so thank you for listening today. If you want to get in touch, send us an email at info.mcliving at gmail.com you can send us comments edits and even future show ideas also please make sure you write a review for our podcast it lets us know how we're doing and it also helps us stand out in the world of podcasting so we'll see you guys next week bye thank you for listening to mid-century living please subscribe tell your friends and leave a review we are available in apple podcasts Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at MCL Podcast. See you next Friday.